Today's that day that those families can start the healing process. This part is done. So as a community, now they get to heal all together. After 17 days of testimony and years of a community on edge, a verdict is in. Former CVS clerk Richard Allen has been found guilty of murdering two middle school girls in Delphi, Indiana. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. A few hours ago, a jury of four men and eight women found Richard Allen guilty for the kidnappings and murders of two teen girls. It's been seven years since 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Liberty German went missing while out on a hike. Their bodies were found a day later on a trail in the woods near where they disappeared. Now, it took until 2022 for prosecutors to finally hone in on Allen. Investigators saying that he had a gun, which they were able to pro prove, held a bullet found at the crime scene. And NBC's Maggie Vespa has more. After more than seven years, a stunning verdict in the Delphi double murder trial, with a jury finding Richard Allen guilty in the 2017 slayings of 13-year-old Abby Williams and her 14-year-old best friend, Libby German. Indiana prosecutors in closing arguments saying Allen slit their throats. He stole the youth and life away from Abby and Libby. Telling jurors the local husband, father, and pharmacy tech is the so-called bridge guy seen in video taken on Libby's cell phone the day the girls went missing and heard in this audio recording as prosecutors said he forced them off a walking trail at gunpoint. The prosecution arguing Allen left their bodies by a creek, Libby naked, saying he left a cartridge from his gun at the scene, owned a black Ford Focus captured on surveillance video nearby and made multiple confessions behind bars, playing a recorded call of Allen telling his wife, I did it, adding, I killed Abby and Libby, his wife pushing back, saying, no, you didn't. Amid a back and forth, Allen softening, saying, maybe I did, I think I did. His wife later crying, saying, no, you didn't. They're screwing with you to get you to say things. The defense calling those false confessions, saying Allen was suffering from psychosis after being held in solitary confinement for 13 months. They argued there's no DNA evidence tying Allen to the scene, said tests comparing that bullet to his gun were inconclusive and blasted the state's desperation after the murders went unsolved for five years. The jury not buying it and tonight convicting a killer in a case that's consumed this tight knit town. Do you think this case will stick with this town is sticking with this? Oh, absolutely. 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 If I not just because of the court case, also it's just because the two little girls have died here and that's just awful. Yeah. That will always be in our hearts. Yeah. It's know? a permanent scar. Yeah. Let's begin Maggie Vespa. Maggie, have we heard from the families of the victims here? Scotty, we haven't, but that was actually to be expected. Despite whether or not they want to speak out, they're actually barred from doing it at this point. The judge, as you know, has kept a gag order over all families, all attorneys, all investigators, everyone tied to this case throughout this trial, and that remains in effect even after hearing the verdict. We expect it to remain through sentencing. That being said, our affiliate, WTHR, published this video. If we can show this earlier today, showing, they say, the wife of Richard Allen, there it is, leaving the courthouse and saying to cameras, quote, this isn't over at all. So that was a stunning moment today. Uh, but back to the girls' families, guys. Inside that courtroom, we were told as the verdict was being read, they were holding hands, they were crying, while Alan Gotti sat emotionless. And with those four counts of guilty, how much prison time is Alan facing here? He's looking out with those four counts, by the way, two counts of murder and then two counts of felony murder, which means murder while committing another felony. In this case, kidnapping a total of 130 years. At this point, his sentencing is scheduled for December 20th. Got it. Well, hopefully some solace there for the community. Maggie Vespa, thank you. Firefighters on the east and west coast are working around the clock to put out dozens of active fires. There's the Jennings Creek wildfire burning on the border of New York and New Jersey. That one spread quickly overnight, burning some 5,000 acres so far. It's now only about 20% contained, and it's already taken one life. Today, a memorial was held for 18-year-old Daniel Vasquez, who worked for the New York Parks Department. He was killed by a fallen tree on Saturday. And one firefighter says the picture of him with his back to the camera was taken just a few moments before he was killed.
And about 100 firefighters were called to put out a fire smack in the middle of, the bro of Brooklyn over the weekend, which burned about two acres of a heavily wooded area of Prospect Park. And out here in California, the mountain fire is still burning in Ventura County. Thousands of people are working to get this thing fully contained. Right now, it's about 36 percent contained, and it's becoming the most destructive fire for any Southern California community since 2018. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin has more. Got a significant progress over the weekend with the mountain fire. Right now, it is 36 percent contained. Only 20,000 acres burned, and that number hasn't moved much since Friday. I want to show you what firefighters call a dirty burn. You can see kind of in this neighborhood, you've got several homes that are still standing, but you've got sprinkles of homes that went up in flames. And most of the time, you have a fire that moves through and pretty much takes out everything in its path because you had embers blowing two and a half miles ahead. That's why certain homes caught fire while the neighbors are still standing. Fire officials are concerned about what could happen this week because while the fire and the flames are mopped up, they're still working to gain full containment because we have yet another Santa Ana wind event which could kick up those furious flames that we saw last week. I spoke with one fire official. He talked about the height of this firestorm, like trying to put a blowtorch out with a squirt gun. He also mentioned that those 80 mile per hour wind gusts were something he had never seen before. The cause of the fire is still under investigation, but a lot of families are returning home and trying to sift through the rubble. Many people looking for priceless family heirlooms, and you've got firefighters out there helping them to dig. Take a listen to what some victims are describing as some things that they've lost and found. This was the kitchen, um, and then the laundry room over there it was the only thing that really important to me that was found and it's my classroom from college 1984. I had an art room here my husband's artwork was always my my husband's artwork was here and then then it's uh, now I'm crying. <laughs> And right now, the number of homes lost, 174, and dozens more have been damaged. It's likely that number will go up because assessment crews are on the ground going property to property to count the number of destroyed homes, and that is going to be a long, lengthy process. Gotti. Dana, thank you. And NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens joins us now. Bill, the threat for fast-moving fires increasing again tomorrow in the east. What areas are you most concerned with? Yeah, God, it just did not rain enough. So, you know, it took one day to dry out. And now that we have another windy day heading to the northeast, uh, we're going to see the fire threat really jumping again. So you know, firefighters had a one day break and that was it. So this was the rainfall amount in northern New England. got like none. New York City, barely any. Philadelphia and D.C. just got a little bit. And that was the first significant rain, if you want to call it significant, since the end of September. So that's why the drought is in place. We've talked about this, you know, you know just building and getting worse and worse. And the rainfall forecast over the next seven days nothing crickets in the new england area all the way through the mid-atlantic so you notice the rain is going to be more towards the middle of the country and in the ohio valley so relief there but the brush fire threat and the wildfire threat is just going to continue anytime it's windy you know, with all the leaves on the ground and everything you know so burnable uh red flag warnings are up again tomorrow so 23 million people included all of long island new york city to boston to the hudson valley and the wind gusts in the middle of the afternoon should be about the 30 to 40 mile per hour range and that's what makes you just nervous god if it gets that that windy and it's that dry that's why we can get those fast moving fires and here in the west we're getting a little bit of rain snow it seems like the Just temperatures are dropping a little right yeah, we've been waiting for, you know, kind of that flip to switch or as we go from the dry season into the rainy season, and it has arrived. It wasn't a huge event, but it did rain in San Francisco today. Sacramento got some rain. Uh, the chains were required earlier on Interstate 80 heading up here through Tahoe. It's kind of dying as it heads down through the Central Valley, but, you know, this is just the beginning. This is going to be an active weather pattern. We have another really big storm coming in here tomorrow afternoon and evening into the Pacific Northwest, more in the evening hours into the overnight, but this will drop, you know, as much as four of rain in the Olympics. And the good news about storms like this, it really puts an end to the threat of fires from the dry season. So that's relief to anyone that lives near those areas. And of course, all the firefighters throughout that region. And then there's possibly another fire behind it coming in on Friday. The one thing you notice, though, we really cut that rainfall off once we get into central California. So that fire threat's still going to remain gaudy, especially mm. as we go to southern California. So like Point Conception southwards, that's the areas that are still going to be dry and it's going to miss what's happening with these storms. Bill Karens, thank you.
And we want to go back to those wildfires for just a moment. The uh, thing that's made these fires such an issue and what's been fueling them is a prolonged and costly drought. And NBC News correspondent Emily Akeda has more on how it's affecting farmers and the future of their business. Stephen Lee can smell smoke from his cranberry farm in Chatsworth, New Jersey, where there are more signs of the region's unrelenting drought. So we shouldn't even be able to be standing here right now. No, we're, we're standing well below a normal water level. A first for the five-generation farm that typically uses this reservoir to flood its colorful cranberry bogs every fall for harvesting. We had to run the pump 24-7 to do our harvest. Uh, that required uh, roughly $800 a day of diesel fuel over a three-week period. So another $20,000 just for harvest water. Parts of southern New Jersey have seen less than a quarter inch of rain since September. That's just 5% of its average precipitation. And the Garden State is not alone. More than half of the continental U.S. is experiencing moderate drought. Thousands of people evacuating near Reno, Nevada today, where billowing smoke can be seen for miles. While in Southern California, nearly 200 homes have already been destroyed, and officials are bracing for another round of Santa Ana winds. NBC's Dana Griffin is on the ground. It's like trying to put a blowtorch out with a squirt gun. The global temperature now on track to set a record high for a second year in a row, leaving farmers like Lee fearing for the future of their businesses. It's concern. We're all concerned that uh, we need rain for a lot of reasons, not just to flood cranberry bogs. Burn scars like this are typically seen out of the West Coast, but here in New Jersey, firefighters have responded to more than 530 wildfires since October. That's about 500 more than what's typical for this time of year. And to make matters worse, red flag warnings were just issued for parts of the Northeast tomorrow. Back to you. Emily Okada, thank you. A little less than a week after former President Trump became president-elect Trump, it looks like his cabinet is starting to take shape. Trump has tacked Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik to serve as U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Trump calling Stefanik a, quote, smart America first fighter. He's also decided to make Lee Zeldin, former Republican congressman from New York, his head of the EPA. And we are also learning that Trump is planning to name Stephen Miller as his deputy chief of staff for policy at the White House, according to a source close to the transition team. And late last night, it was announced that Tom Homan, who used to be the acting head of ICE during Trump's first term, will now be Trump's border czar. Homan has said that workplace raids going after undocumented workers would be carried out under the new Trump administration. Trump seems to make that point clear on social media, saying Homan will be, quote, in charge of all deportation of illegal aliens back to their country of origin. And all this comes after NBC News is calling Arizona for Trump. That happened over the weekend, giving Trump 312 electoral college votes, having won all seven battleground states. And let's bring in NBC's Dasha Burns to tell us more. Dasha, President-elect uh, Donald Trump, he seems to be moving very fast here. Who's a, a definite yes and who's a maybe at this point? Yeah, moving really fast and a lot faster than he did in 2016 as he was going to the White House for the first time, according to all of the sources that I've been talking to. So you've got Susie Wiles as chief of staff, which is critical. She's been by his side throughout this entire campaign, and most folks credit her for the reason it's been a little less of a dramatic campaign, a little bit less of the palace intrigue than we've had in his previous two campaigns. Uh, then you've got uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik from New York. She's been a staunch Trump advocate. From the beginning, she will be ambassador to the U.N. You've got Tom Homan. You mentioned he is a hardline uh, immigration guy who is part of the Trump administration plan to make immigration a top priority. Another person who is one of those hardliners on that issue, Gotti, is Stephen Miller, who we have confirmed uh, from our reporting is going to be deputy chief of staff on policy. He's already behind the scenes uh, been pu putting together a plan to execute that mass deportation operation that former President Trump, now President-elect Trump, promised on the campaign trail. And then today we got the news of of Lee Zeldin, who will be stepping into the EPA. And we just confirmed moments ago, Gotti, that Representative Mike Walls is going to uh, hmm. be heading up. Uh, he's going to be the national security advisor. That's a key position. Um, Mike Walls is someone who has served in the 
military, Green Beret veteran, and now will be serving at the side of the former president in the administration for a role that, by the way, does not requ require congressional approval, Gotti. Interesting. There's also, I mean, this curtain, right? There are the people behind the curtain, and then there are the people that are in front of the curtain that still haven't been officially named Elon Musk, RFK Jr. Uh, any word on where they might officially land here? Well, both of them, Gotti, have been spending a whole lot of time at Mar-a-Lago. Elon Musk is not likely to get an official cabinet position. He would have to divest from his businesses, which he doesn't want to do. But he is already making his voice heard. He's highly influential and has the ear of the former uh, president, President-elect Trump. And RFK Jr. also spending a whole lot of time down at Mar-a-Lago, and it's widely understood among uh, transition staff that he's going to play a big role when it comes to health policy. I keep hearing that it's unlikely that he will be able to get that critical uh, congressional approval, Senate confirmation, but there are other ways that he can be uh, deployed by President-elect Trump to, to get stuff done when it comes to health and agriculture, Gotti. And, Dasha, Trump and Biden are expected to meet this week at the White House. Do we know how that's going to go down? Well, so this is a courtesy that has been a tradition for a long time. By the way, it's a courtesy that uh, President Trump did not extend to then-president-elect Biden back in 2020, uh, as he didn't concede the election. It's something that happened, though, between Trump and President Obama. That meeting was about 90 minutes. And typically, the uh, vice president-elect and the VP have a meeting as well, though, as of now, we're still waiting for a lot of details on this, Scotty. As of now, we're not expecting uh, Vice President Harris and Vice President-elect Vance to meet. We're also not expecting uh, that Melania Trump will be at that meeting, though, again, we're still uh, waiting on some of those details. To be a fly on the wall. Dasha Burns, thank you. And we've got more news on the upcoming and incoming Trump administration that could affect hundreds of thousands of migrants. NBC News has some exclusive reporting that says that the Trump transition team seems to be trying to figure out how to deport migrants who took part in two Biden programs that created legal pathways to enter the country. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley has the details. Gotti, what we're learning is that there are these programs that the Biden administration started for migrants to be able to apply legally from their home countries in order to come to the United States. And it was part of a strategy from the Biden administration to try to get more migrants to apply from their home countries rather than taking the dangerous journey and crossing the border illegally and overwhelm U.S. resources. That was the strategy. That was the promise that these people agreed to. In fact, the U.S. has taken in about 30,000 migrants from Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela under that program over the past two years. There's also been a program for migrants from any country when they're in northern Mexico to sign up for an asylum interview and an appointment for an asylum screening on their phones over the CBP-1 app. That's something we've talked about a lot on this show, something that at first had some issues, but then by and large became status quo. Shelters in Mexico are now full of migrants waiting for their asylum appointments. Now this is something we understand that Trump could end as soon as he takes office, both of those programs. Not only end them for the next people to come through the door, but he could actually take away the legal status of people who entered through those programs that they have not yet gotten the protections of asylum or gotten on the path to asylum. And for a lot of those migrants, who applied from their home countries, it might be that they haven't applied for asylum yet because they were given two-year work authorization. So it's basically pulling the rug out from under people who thought they did everything that they needed to to come into this country legally, at least on a temporary basis. But if you think about those populations, again, Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, I know at least two of those the Haitians and the Venezuelans have really been in the target of Trump on the campaign trail this year. He's talked about Venezuelan gangs. He's talked about Haitians in cities in Ohio. Uh, these are the people who Trump has really been focusing on when he talks about mass deportation forces. Now, we understand that people who are part of these programs might not be the top of the list for deportations. Those are people who are likely to have criminal convictions or be a threat to public safety or national security. We also understand that they consider Chinese males of military age to be one of those priorities and consider them a threat to public safety. Um, these people who came in legally, though, they might not be at the top of the list, but without those protections, protections they signed up thinking that they would have before they came into this country, they could be eligible for deportation. And that will help the Trump presidency 
boost those numbers because they've been promising something big and something visible. As all part of new pieces that are moving around the board, of course, things could change. But this does give us a window into where this incoming administration is looking to go as they try to fulfill these very draconian and hardline immigration promises. Gotti. Julia Ainsley, thank you. And Republicans will take control of the Senate in the new Congress this January. And this week, we could find out who's going to lead that new majority. Republican Senators John Cornyn of Texas and Rick Scott of Florida and John Thune of South Dakota are openly running for the top spot in the conference ahead of the leadership vote on Wednesday. Meanwhile, control of the House is still unclear, with several competitive races remaining uncalled, including key races out here in California. And as Dasha just mentioned, President-elect Donald Trump has selected Representative Waltz to serve as his national security advisor. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now. Ryan, we just heard Dasha say the president-elect has also picked Elise Stefanik for U.S. ambassador. That is two potential vacant House seats. How is that going to play out? Well, it, it could make life difficult for Speaker Mike Johnson if he's able to hold on to that job. And that's because right now, the way it's tracking, Republicans are going to hold on to the majority in the House of Representatives but their margins could be really thin. Uh, there's only 17 races right now that NBC has yet to call. 13 of those races, it were Democrats, I should say, would need to win 13 of those races in order to retain the majority. And the way it looks like it's breaking, uh, it seems as though it's probably going to be about an even split. Uh, we're looking at races in California and Arizona that have yet to be called. The at-large race in Alaska is another one of these races that have still yet to be called. But ultimately, Republicans are looking at a majority of anywhere between five and seven seats, which is really not that much. Then you take into account that at least two House members, and at least Stefanik and Mike Walls, are going to be going into the administration immediately. Those are two vacancies that will take some time to fill. Mm -hmm. uh, they have It requires a special election that could be 45 days before uh, a new member is seated. So that's another two seats down that Mike Johnson will be. Even though Republicans are going to control everything, that's still going to make it difficult to get even basic things passed. And with these 17 seats still outstanding, like what is the top one that you check for, the, the one that you're refreshing on your phone constantly? Yeah, well, that one in Alaska is definitely a, an interesting one. That's a seat that's currently held by Democrats. But, of course, Donald Trump won Alaska by a pretty significant margin. The incumbent there, Mary Peltola, is holding on. Alaska is a ranked voting state, though, so that does complicate the vote counting process a little bit. Uh, it does look, though, uh, though the, the, her Republican challenger is... Uh, is gaining on her and has the potential of flipping that seat. There's also two seats in California, uh, of which uh, both Republicans hold one, Democrats hold another, where you could see potential flips. But again, the way this is playing out is that there isn't really significant gains for either party based on where things currently stand. So Republicans enjoy a three-seat edge right now, a net gain of three seats. I think when all the dust is settled, we're somewhere in the range of a five to seven majority for House Republicans. And things are heating up for Senate Majority Leader. Uh, who's a top contender right now? We heard those three names, but who's your money on? Yeah, it's between John Cornyn of Texas, uh, Rick Scott of Florida, and John Thune of South Dakota. Uh, Rick Scott's making an aggressive public push uh, to try and convince his fellow senators that he has the ear of Donald Trump, that he is the one most loyal to Donald Trump. He's had a number of uh, conservative uh, uh, Internet influencers uh, back him up, people like Tucker Carlson, Charlie K Kirk, even Elon Musk, who we know is very close with President Trump. Uh, but the one person we haven't heard from is Donald Trump himself. And if Donald Trump wanted to end this race tomorrow, he could do that. But this is a secret ballot, so you're not going to see these senators being pressured by outside forces to make a decision that they don't want to make. Uh, it's likely that it's going to be Cornyn or Thune because they're the ones with the experience. Uh, and even though there have been a lot of changes to the Senate Republican conference, uh, they are still pretty traditional guys. Always interesting to hear influencers' influence extending all the way into the halls of Congress there. Ryan Nobles, thank you. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, Cuba rocked by another natural disaster. This time, the island hit by a strong earthquake. What we are learning about widespread damage there. Plus, panic when a Spirit Airlines jet is hit by gunfire. The cabin riddled with bullet holes. Who's being blamed for this and the actions several airlines are now taking? And later this hour, honoring the fallen. On this Veterans Day, a daughter's mission to find her father after he was lost in Vietnam. The answer, decades in the making. 
it might be just one little bone, but it sure uh, is a huge, long sought after answer. Let's take a quick look around the world. U.S. officials say Russia has thousands of soldiers trying to retake Russia's Kursk region. That's an area uh, that Ukraine gained control of back in August. North Korean troops are also on the front lines there, with the Pentagon confirming 10,000 North Korean soldiers are training with Russian forces. This comes as Ukraine launched its largest drone attacks in Moscow yesterday. And over in Ukraine, President Zelensky had a call with President-elect Trump and an unexpected guest. Several sources are saying Elon Musk joined their call last Wednesday, and that talk was apparently short. Ukrainian officials say Musk was not directly on the line. Zelensky has said they both agreed to maintain close dialogue and advance their cooperation. And a pretty big earthquake and a bunch of aftershocks shook Cuba this weekend. The 6.8 magnitude quake hit the eastern part of the island. So far, fortunately, there haven't been any reports of major damage or people hurt, but it comes after weeks of blackouts left the island reeling and a Category 3 hurricane. Rafael made landfall there last Wednesday. The shooting in central Mexico has killed 10 people, hurt at least seven others. We understand four gunmen entered a bar on Saturday, randomly shooting people inside. Officials there identified the suspects by tracking the license plate of the car they fled in. So far, one person has been arrested. Meanwhile, leaders from 80 different countries are in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia for an emergency summit on the war in Gaza and the crisis with Iran. Saudi's crown prince asking Israel not to attack the, quote, sisterly Islamic Republic of Iran. And the wording there is important because Saudi Arabia and Iran have long been adversaries. But this specific language indicates that relationship might be softening from the events of last year. Meanwhile, Israel's new defense minister says the IDF has defeated Hezbollah, and those remarks come after a barrage of airstrikes came down in Lebanon and northern Gaza yesterday, killing dozens. NBC News correspondent Danielle Hamamjin has more. Well, Israel said today that progress has been made on ceasefire talks here in Lebanon and indicated that Russia could play a part in stopping Hezbollah from rearming through Syria. Hezbollah said that it has not received any proposal. Meanwhile, the bombardment of Lebanon continues. Today, in northern Lebanon, in the village of Ain Yaqub, 30 people were killed. That's just today. Yesterday, another 23 were killed. In a village of Almat, also in northern Lebanon, among those killed, seven children. To Gaza, where in the past day, the number of dead children is double that, nearly 13 who were killed by an Israeli airstrike on a house in Jabalia. Now, six months ago, the area there was described as an unrecognizable wasteland. Six months later, it's hard to find the words to describe it today. The IDF says the Hamas has regrouped and reestablished itself on the ground in northern Gaza. The UN says the northern Gaza is uh, at imminent risk of famine, and it is a question of days, not weeks. The U.S. has imposed on Israel a 30-day deadline to improve the humanitarian situation, and that deadline expires on Tuesday. Danielle Hamamjan, thank you for that reporting. And coming up, the controversial law that's apparently having a big impact here in California. What's the deal with Prop 65 and the positive results? Our Morgan Chesky is going to be breaking all that down. But first, you got to see this. A hidden camera at the Oregon Zoo did not stay hidden for long. A pride of lions found it during a pool party, giving it a, a, an extreme close-up. Kind of looks like they knew someone was watching. All kinds of main character energy, because, because you know, lions have manes. We'll be right back. And now to the tense situation developing in Haiti, where a passenger plane came under gunfire as it was approaching Port-au-Prince today. The Spirit Airlines flight from Fort Lauderdale was diverted to the Dominican Republic after the shooting, which left one flight attendant hurt. The U.S. Embassy says this is part of gang-led efforts to block travel in and out of Haiti's capital city, just as the island's new prime minister was being sworn in. Marissa Parra is following the latest from the airport in Fort Lauderdale. Marissa? 
Scotty, a tough situation all around. Certainly scary for the people who were on board, but also devastating for the Haitians who have been waiting years for stability in their country. So this specific incident, we had this plane that took off from here in Fort Lauderdale, and it was supposed to be landing in Port-au-Prince. This happened around 1230 local time, and instead, roughly 50 passengers and crew members were diverted to the Dominican Republic instead. And what we're seeing and hearing is from Spirit Airlines. Here's their statement explaining, quote, the evidence of damage to the aircraft consistent with gunfire. They add in that same statement that the safety of our guests and team members is our top priority. And you can see bullet holes in the side of the passenger cabin. And Spirit does say one flight attendant was injured. We don't know the extent of the injuries, how they were injured. We do know that they're getting treatment. But as we also know, this could have been a fatal event. And as a result, we have Spirit Airlines, American Airlines, JetBlue suspending all service to and from Haiti, quote, pending further evaluation. The airport in Port-au-Prince temporarily shut down. We also know that Spirit says they were arranging a different aircraft to pick up those passengers, crew members who wanted to return to the States. They arranged a flight to Fort Lauderdale that's supposed to be landing at some point tonight. And in terms of what else we're hearing, we're learning a little bit more from the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince. They released this statement. They said, in part, quote, that they're aware of gang-led efforts to block travel to and from Port-au-Prince, which may include armed violence and disruption to roads ports and airports. And Gotti, within the greater context here, we have reported on this show, you and I have talked about the instability in Haiti, and it dates back even to 2021. The assassination of the prime minister then led to what has really become a vacuum of power and a fight for power. At points at certain times this year, since Ariel Henry, the former prime minister, resigned, we have seen what has looked like and appeared to be essentially gang rule in Haiti. There was an interim prime minister who was appointed, and that interim prime minister was fired yesterday. A new interim prime minister sworn in today amid all of this unrest and clearly what we saw today with this airplane being shot at. This is certainly disappointing for so many of the Haitians that I've spoken to who have just said they want nothing more than to see democracy and stability in their country, and clearly a lot of work to be done in that arena, Gotti. Maurice Sapara, thank you. And good news for those of us here in California. This controversial law here might actually be having some pretty positive results. For almost 40 years, the Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act, or Prop 65 as it's known, has mandated companies warn consumers about 900 different potentially harmful chemicals in their products. Think a warning label on everything from like vinyl covered Bibles to gas station pumps. And it turns out it might be working pretty well. A brand new study finds that, quote, Californians generally had lower levels of biomonitored chemicals than the rest of the U.S. population. Joining us now is NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky. Morgan, uh, you moved here just recently. I remember when I moved to California, this has to do with those signs that you see that it's like cancer everywhere, <laughs> danger, chemicals abound, right? These signs are absolutely <laughs> everywhere, Gotti. Definitely makes you think twice whenever you first come into the state and you realize that they're putting out this warning. Prop 65 covers 900 chemicals. Uh, this study done by the Silent Spring and UC Berkeley researchers, they took 11 of those chemicals that they really wanted to zero in on, and they used these samples that they collected from the CDC urine and blood samples. And specifically what they found here, Gotti, is that chemicals particularly used to make plastics flexible, chloroform, which comes when you disinfect water with chlorine, and toluene, which is a substance found in vehicle exhaust, were lower, uh, not just in Californians that were tested here, but in samples collected nationwide. Hmm. One of the reasons for that, Gotti, is that these companies, whenever this came out, they couldn't make a different chemical recipe for California right. and then the rest of the country. So they acknowledged in certain cases that they changed the formula and that's why we're seeing some of the results lower elsewhere. Important content. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so that means that the state laws here in California kind of dictated the, the rest of the nation by uh, proxy? In certain cases, yes. Companies acknowledge that they had to tweak the formula accordingly. And as such, that's why we're seeing some of these lower levels elsewhere. Now, I do think some important context in this study, Gotti, comes in the fact that while Californians saw their levels lower than the nation, particularly with the chemical associated with the diesel, uh, there were a couple chemicals that Californians were higher than the rest of the country, uh, notably mercury and Botox. a... 
<laughs> Mercury and a chemical that I learned about today called styrene. Now, the researchers said that they didn't have time to do a deep dive into mercury and styrene, but they assumed because California consumes so much fish, right. fish carry mercury, that, that could be a potential connection there. And styrene is a chemical found in vehicle rubber in, Cars, in the tires traffic we have, maybe yeah. causation correlation is uh, still too soon to tell right but they were asking for more funding sense. to take a deeper dive here but certainly food for thought yeah so traffic causes cancer i mean i can i, I can see that there you go <laughs> morgan chesky thank you thanks and you outraged tonight as the Women's Tennis Association held its final tournament in Saudi Arabia. That event was branded as an opportunity to inspire young girls, but it was blasted by critics who say women in Saudi Arabia still don't have equal rights. Saudi Arabia has aggressively pushed its way into international sports, and as some are accusing them of so-called sports washing. NBC's Yasmin Basugian breaks it all down. As American sensation Coco Goff celebrates her win at the Women's Tennis Association finals this weekend, there's controversy. Not over who won, but where it happened. Riyadh, capital of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Critics point out the irony of a religious monarchy with a poor record on human rights, where women are second-class citizens now playing host to one of the top events in women's sports. Former world number one Martina Navratilova slammed the move in an interview with the New York Times earlier this month, saying, quote, women have to be equal citizens under the law. Otherwise, we might as well play in North Korea. Coco Goff echoing those concerns before playing. I would be lying to you if I said I had no reservations. But going on to say she hoped her presence would inspire change for women in the country. The WTA telling The Athletic, quote, we believe it is the right thing to open up new opportunities for women to play professional tennis in different countries. The WTA didn't respond to our request for comment. The prize money for contestants, more than $15 million. It's the latest in a years-long push by Saudi Arabia into the world of sports, which some call sports washing, an attempt to launder the image of the authoritarian kingdom through high-profile competitions. Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the de facto ruler of the kingdom, told Fox News last year those accusations don't bother him. Well, if sport washing is going to increase my GDP by 1%, percent, then I will continue doing sport washing. In 2021, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia completing a controversial takeover of British Premier League soccer club Newcastle United and attracting some of soccer's biggest stars, like Neymar and Cristiano Ronaldo, the Saudi Pro Soccer League with unbeatable contracts. The country's also on track to host the 2034 Men's World Cup, setting off controversy. The Saudis taking a big swing at golf too, when it backed Live in 2021, an entirely new league to compete with the PGA, again luring top athletes with massive money. The next year, then former President Trump himself taking heat for hosting a live tournament at his Bedminster club with some 9-11 victims families critical of the Saudis running this ad. This golf tournament is taking place 50 miles from ground zero. It's disgusting. The tournament and live played on. Now the election of Donald Trump as president again, potentially boosting the Saudis sports ambitions. The last time he was president, Trump maintained close ties with the Saudi crown prince especially through his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, whose private equity fund received $2 billion from the Saudis after he and Trump left the White House. Golf star Rory McIlroy speculating Trump could help get a merger deal done between the PGA and Liv. Trump has a great relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, he's got a great relationship with golf. He's a lover of golf, so maybe. Who, who knows? The president-elect has said he could get the merger done in 15 minutes. Trump's transition team didn't respond to our request for comment. While Coco Goff may have won the latest tournament, Saudi Arabia is clearly hoping to push ahead in women's sports, as women's rights there still very much behind. And before we go, it is time for the future of everything. Wall Street's good vibes are still high post-election day, and we can say the same about the crypto market right now. So what could Trump's win do for Bitcoin and other currency? That's coming up in the future of crypto. Plus, on this Veterans Day, a woman's 50-year journey to bring her father home right in time for Veterans Day. Thank you. And tonight in the future of everything, the future of crypto under Trump. But first, I remember those robot dogs from Boston Dynamics. Well, in a sign of the times, they are now guarding Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. 
Since his election win, security at the Florida residence has ramped up with those armed patrol boats and high-tech hounds now combing the, the grounds there. The Secret Service says these dogs can detect bombs, chemical threats, and they come with thermal cameras and high-res zoom. And in other robot news, one of the first pieces of artwork by a humanoid robot just sold for over a hundred, a million, one million human dollars at Sotheby's auction house. Meet AIDA, an AI robot with a bob there that painted the World War II codebreaker Alan Turing using a 3D textured printer. Sotheby's called this sale a modern art milestone, highlighting the intersection of AI and the global art market. And more enthusiasm on Wall Street after Donald Trump's election win. The Dow Jones surging more than 300 points today, closing about 44,000 for the first time ever. The S&P also finishing with a record close. And it's not just Wall Street. The world's biggest cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, hit a record high over the weekend. Back in August, Trump said crypto would, quote, define the future, adding he wanted the currency to be mined, made, and minted in the USA. But in an industry with little regulation, what's that actually going to look like? Let's bring in NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung to get some answers. Brian, uh, well, first, let's just talk, touch on the markets there. Is Trump win? Is that what's driving all of this? Yeah, well, I mean, Gotti, that's most of it. When you consider that we've been blowing through record highs over the past few market days, and that includes today with the Dow and the S&P hitting new records and new milestones, too, uh, over 44,000 and 6,000, respectively. The big story behind the market rip is just the expectation for a pro-business Trump administration, uh, part two, if you will. And that's because, obviously, a as a preview from what we got from the first administration, what businesses and investors are largely expecting is lower regulation and lower tax rates for some of the largest companies in America. Investors appear to like that. That's the reason why they've been pouring into stocks. And that explains why they broke those very big records uh, today and over the past few days as well, Gotti. And let's talk a little bit of crypto here. I mean, there's a, there's a 180 from Trump talking about uh, not really liking crypto to, to, I guess, having his own coin. Why is Trump pushing for the U.S. to become the crypto capital of the world? Yeah, I mean, the language three years ago was Trump saying in an interview that he thinks Bitcoin is a scam. And then what did he end up doing on the campaign trail? Well, he spoke at the Bitcoin conference, the first uh candidate for U.S. president to do so. He has really leaned into this in, in part because he's gotten a lot of campaign dollars from the crypto industry, but also because I think he knows that the fan base is very similar to, to you know, that kind of male, extremely online demographic that does really well for him. And, you know, by the way, this graphic that you're looking at of Bitcoin hitting a record of $87,000 is even outdated because in just the last few hours, we saw Bitcoin flirt with around $89,000. In fact, if you rewind to about 12 hours ago, it was floating at around $81,000, $82,000. So in just half a day, we've already seen people make big gains on crypto. And it's for the same reasons as the broader market. It's expectations for lower regulation coming from a pro-crypto candidate, which, by the way, Gotti, has also launched his own crypto project called World Liberty Financial. Uh, there's some ethics questions around that as well. But obviously, he's, very, he's leaning very heavily into this. And, and what happens to the entire crypto industry if regulations start getting peeled back here? Yeah, well, look, I mean, when it comes to just the overall story, when it comes to cryptocurrencies, the adoption of it, not just among casuals, but also by financial institutions. When you look at the likes of BlackRock and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Fidelity, even offering their own Bitcoin products, everyday investors that have a stock portfolio can now dip into Bitcoin as well. That has largely been bullish, not just for Bitcoin, but for other cryptocurrencies as well, like Dogecoin, like Ethereum. There's a long list of other currencies that have benefited from that. Dogecoin, by the way, up about 19 percent uh, just today. So if Trump does have that pro crypto agenda going into his first days in office, which includes, for example, changing the head over at the Securities and Exchange Commission, that would be a big deal for the space. And not to harsh the crypto vibe here, but like what would Satoshi Nakamoto think of all this? Wasn't the whole point of crypto to be this decentralized anti-establishment alternative to money as we know it? Yeah, there is certainly this irony in the fact that this cryptocurrency, which was supposed to be a way for a, a reprieve for investors and, you know, finance like minded to use a currency that exists outside of the traditional banking system to be endorsed by the president of the United States, the largest uh, economy in the world. But I do think that when it comes to Satoshi, we can't ask him directly because we don't know who it is. I mean, Gotti, it could be me. It could be you. It could be anybody. We don't know.
I figured as much. That's what I thought. <laughs> Brian Chung, thank you so much. Finally tonight, in honor of Veterans Day, how a daughter of a fallen Marine spent decades fighting to bring her father home. Courtney QB shows us this incredible story. On a clear day at Arlington National Cemetery, Captain Ronald Forrester was laid to rest, ending his daughter's 51-year journey to find her father after his plane disappeared over Vietnam when she was just two years old. When Daddy was shot down. We were told not to give up hope. But after years of waiting, Karen's hope was shattered when all servicemen missing in action in Southeast Asia were declared presumed dead. I remember being so confused because nobody could tell me what happened to my dad. Captain Forrester's name was engraved on the walls at the National Cemetery of the Pacific, and a tormented Karen began her own mission. This kid wanted to know where her dad was. But she wasn't the only one looking. The Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, or DPAA, was created to find and identify those lost in battle. Their scientists travel around the world, interviewing witnesses, excavating sites, and gathering any remains left behind. Pocket knife, a key, toothbrush, some different things that may have been on the individual when they went missing all carefully transported back to their lab in Hawaii and tested against DNA samples, usually from next of kin. There are over 80,000 unresolved um, cases from our past conflicts. Dr. Deborah Prinzini is deputy director of the lab. It's really humbling and it's a really wonderful mission to be a part of. In 1991, DPAA teams started searching a rice paddy where a U.S. plane may have crashed in 1972. The investigation continued for over 30 years until last December. So you were able to identify both of the, the individuals who were lost in that crash? We were. Karenie was about to learn. They finally found her father. We got a match. Her dad identified by a gas card with his name on it and a single bone fragment that matched his DNA. It might be just one little bone, but it sure uh, is a huge long sought after answer. Captain Ronald W. Forrester. Karenie attended a ceremony in Hawaii, tapping a small rosette next to her dad's name on the memorial wall, signifying he'd been found. And thanking the men and women from DPAA who never stopped searching. Thank you so much. <laughs> Your work changed my life. After a journey spanning five decades and crossing the world, Karen brought her dad to his final resting place. Closure for a daughter who vowed never to give up. Courtney Kuby, NBC News, Honolulu, Hawaii. Hmm. Courtney Kuby, thank you. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.